Welcome back. Okay, we're talking about uh, machine learning control. And in particular, the first uh, sequence of, of video lectures, we're going to be talking about using evolutionary algorithms and genetic algorithms for designing good effective control laws. Okay, I'm going to start off simple with the genetic algorithm, then we're going to jump into genetic programming, and we're going to show how you can apply this for uh, both controlling simple systems and controlling very complex systems. Okay. So evolutionary algorithms are, are based on this kind of biological principle of natural selection. So you have this, uh, this population of control laws. You start with an initial population or generation of control laws. You let them all compete. You see how effective they all are. Uh, you essentially rate them based on their fitness or how good or badly they optimize your objective function. And then there are some genetic operations so that that generation, the effective control laws from that generation can somehow breed more effective control laws in the next generation. So there's this idea of natural selection, of mutations and evolution, and of um, kind of coding up the information that makes the control law effective so that you can swap and tune and modify that, that information. So I'm going to walk you through this starting with a genetic algorithm. Um, here's kind of the big picture view of genetic algorithms. We're going to walk through this. You have some generation of control laws, which are parameterized by a sequence of number, numbers. Um, each of those has some performance on a cost function, which gives them a, uh, an associated fitness, which is also related to their probability of selection. There are some genetic operations here that give rise to my future generations. And the idea is that this is a targeted optimization that selectively improves from generation to generation to get more and more effective control laws. Now, um, I'm going to illustrate this on the simple case of using a genetic algorithm to tune a PID controller here. Um, I would definitely caution you, you should not be tuning PID controllers using genetic algorithms in most cases. There are far simpler ways to do this. Um, this is an illustration of, of how you could use a genetic algorithm in a system where we kind of know the answer and we know how it behaves. And then you could generalize that to much more complicated control systems. So this is an analogy. I'm not saying you should tune PID controllers with genetic algorithms, but I'm going to walk through how you use genetic algorithms on this example. So if I have a PID controller for some system, Basically, I have some reference value and some measurement y, and the PID controller breaks this up into some kind of, okay, so you have this error signal, which is the difference between where I want to be and where I am. And you want to make that error signal as small as possible, as fast as possible, without a lot of overshoot and ringing and stuff like that. So the first line of attack is just, if I have a big error, multiply it by a number, a proportional gain, and feed that into the system. So if I have a big error, I get a larger control signal that brings me closer and closer. The other thing I can do is I can integrate up that error. So if I've had a lot of error for a long time, my control gets more aggressive. And I can also have a derivative of that error. So if I have a big jump in error, my control can respond much more rapidly to those, those fast rises in error. So simple PID controller, you know, this is old, old uh, technology we've we played around with before. What we can do now is use a genetic algorithm to tune this PID control law for some high level objective. And so what the genetic algorithm does is it assumes a structure for your control law. In this case, we have locked in, we've hard coded the PID structure, this topology here. And we've made it so that there are three numbers that we get to optimize, kp, ki, and kd, these, um, these proportional integral and derivative gain uh, gains. Okay? And that's all that genetic algorithms knows about is that there are these three numbers that it gets to, to tune to get better performance. And so the first step in a genetic algorithm, once you have the structure locked in, is to somehow turn those numbers into like a genetic sequence. This is supposed to mirror DNA, the DNA of the controller now. And here I'm, I'm oversimplifying this into bits, um, these kind of three-bit representations of KP, KI, and KD just for, for pictorial purposes. So each of these has three numbers associated with them, and I get to tune those sequences to get you know, bigger KP or smaller KP, bigger KI or smaller KI, and so on and so forth. And so there's essentially this large parameter cube that you're working with in this case. For these three parameters, I get a cube. And what I'm trying to do, what I've plotted here in color, is essentially my cost function, my objective function, which I haven't defined here, but 
we'll define that later. I have some objective function landscape, and what I'm trying to do is optimize it for these bright hot spots where the parameters are really, really good to get the best performance. And I want to stay away from these kind of red and dark spots where I get really, really bad objective performance. And so this genetic algorithm is essentially going to be sampling this high dimensional space, trying to hone in on these bright patches of good parameter values to optimize the system performance. What's nice about genetic algorithms is that these scale pretty well to very high dimensional search spaces. Um, so one strategy would be something like a Monte Carlo search. If I have a, a 10 dimensional space, I could just randomly, randomly sample and try to find these, these, uh, these hot spots. But as the system scales, that becomes less and less feasible. You get the curse of dimensionality, and the volume of this gets so large that the probability of you just randomly finding these hotspots becomes uh, vanishingly small. Genetic algorithms is a little bit smarter. It starts off with an initial population, which is kind of a Monte Carlo sample. But then, if it, if it gets near a hotspot, it kind of you know, optimizes around and finds kind of the peak of that hotspot. And it also spends more energy uh, exploring the hotspot regions that it finds after the initial search. So I'll walk you through what that means in a little bit. But basically, genetic algorithms is, uh, are a set of optimization techniques for high dimensional search spaces of parameters once you've had a locked structure. So we lock in the structure. We define a set of parameters we're trying to optimize that defines a high dimensional cost landscape. And the genetic algorithm is a way of essentially finding these hotspots of best performance in a way that's faster than just a brute force Monte Carlo search. Okay? So I want to walk you through this, this genetic algorithm diagram here on this particular example. And then next time, we'll code this up in MATLAB and see how it works. Okay? So again, in this example PID controller, I had three parameters, which gives me this kind of cube. Every point can be defined as this, these kind of nine bit uh, number. And what I would do is I would start out with a generation of candidate control laws. And maybe I would, I would initialize this randomly. I'd just randomly generate, I don't know, 10 candidate control laws. And the size of this population could be bigger or smaller, depending on how expensive it, expensive it is to try these control laws. So in this case, I have 10 candidate control laws I chose randomly. What I would then do is I would actually run my physical system or my simulation with each of these control laws, and I'd run it and see how they actually perform. I'd basically measure you know, what is the intensity of that particular grid cell of parameter values. Is it really, really dark, low performance, or is it really, really bright, high performance? And then what I would get, so I had that, that kind of initial generation, and I would sort them by their performance on this cost function. So in this case, I'm trying to minimize my cost because you know, I want small cost. And so here I've sorted all of my initial generation by cost function. So this is somehow the best performing control law, and this is the worst performing control law. So now what the uh, genetic algorithm does is it essentially uses these cost functions, the performance, the fitness, to determine the probability of each of these control laws advancing to the next generation. Okay, so these are going to kind of breed in some weird way. And I want the most effective control laws to be more expressed in the next generation's genetic pool than these least effective uh, control laws. And so based on this probability of selection, essentially there are a number of these genetic operations I get to choose from. And I'm just going to walk you through kind of the simplest four, but there are modifications to these. So the first one is called elitism. And you don't always have to include this, but, but sometimes it's good. If you have a good control law, maybe just copy it directly over to the next generation, because I don't want to lose this control law you know, randomly get worse over time. So maybe I'll do this elitism and copy it over. And that'll just be hard coded. I always copy the best one or two over. The next uh, kind of step we could do is replication. So it's very much like elitism, but it's, it's random. So I may or may not decide to replicate, and I may or may not decide to replicate any of these based on a coin flip probability. So uh, however unlikely it is, I might actually replicate this bad one, but it's unlikely. Okay, the other genetic operations uh, crossover is kind of like um, like sexual reproduction. So you basically take two uh, two high performing control laws. In this case, it's these guys, and I will randomly select different portions. It's hard to see. There's a blue circle here and a red circle. So we've randomly selected those snippets of of kind of controlled DNA, and we're going to swap them 
in the future generations. So in this crossover, you essentially swap some DNA and you get two new control laws. And so you're essentially trying to take you know, the best parts of both control laws and figure out you know, maybe this control law was good because of one part and this control law was good because of another part. And if I swap them, I can get a child who is good in both aspects. Okay, that's this kind of crossover. And then finally, I have mutation, which is basically I take a control law and I pick some, some portion of this genetic sequence and I just randomly change those values. So those are the basic uh, genetic operations we have to work with. The way we actually do this, the way you actually create this, this K plus one generation, is you essentially go down the list after, after elitism. What I do is I basically flip a coin and there's some mixture of probabilities. Maybe, maybe I replicate 10%. Uh, I do 50% crossover and 40% mutation. Those are the rates of those genetic operations. So for each of these rows, I essentially flip a coin and decide, am I going to do a replication, a crossover, or a mutation? And then once I've decided that, I flip another coin and I figure out kind of which of these, you know, based on this probability of selection, which of these uh, individuals from generation K get mutated, crossed over, or, or replicated over here. And so then you generate this generation K plus one, which somehow statistically should be more effective than this generation because you're taking the best, most effective performers and mapping them over. So this is essentially a big optimization loop to uh, kind of iteratively, generation to generation, find more and more effective parameters for control. And genetic algorithms is not designed just for control. You can use this for any optimization. You can do this for sensor placement, um, all kinds of things. But I'm just showing you how you would do this to tune a PID controller. Okay. Um, what else do I want to tell you about this? So crossover generally is more exploratory. So remember we had that cost landscape. Crossover is going to try new things that you haven't seen before. No, that's wrong. Sorry, that's, that's totally wrong. Crossover is exploitative. It's going to take, if you have two individuals that are in a hot spot, it's going to try to exploit the good features and get a more optimal solution that's closer to the center of that hot spot. Whereas mutation is exploratory. Mutation, even if I'm near a hot spot, I might try something new and hope that I get more optimal. So mutation serves to explore your parameter space, whereas crossover serves to exploit things you've already found that are successful. Okay, so let me just say that one more time because I said it wrong the first time. Crossover and mutation have these dual roles, these kind of complementary roles. Crossover is more exploitative, so it takes known good structures and exploits them to get even better known structures. And mutation is more explore, explore, explorative. It, it explores your parameter space more. So it takes good parameters and then it kind of mutates them to explore other options that you might not have seen. Because in lots of these, these optimization algorithms, if I find a, a maximum, it'll just optimize right up to the top of that maximum and stay there. What mutation does is it allows me to jump and maybe find a more global maximum. Okay? So you have these dual roles of ex exploring and exploiting. And you can, you can essentially change the probability of how often I cross over versus mutate to favor ex ex exploration or exploitation more. Okay? Uh, okay, so that's the overview of genetic algorithms. I've kind of motivated this on a PID control. We're going to then code this up in MATLAB and actually see how generation to generation these control laws get more and more effective. Okay, thank you.